All right, we're looking at part two in an introduction to Revelation. And we're looking at Revelation from a preteristic view. And the preterist view looks at Revelation although as though all the prophecies in Revelation have already been fulfilled. Now, some people say, well, that, how can it already be fulfilled? I'm going to explain that in a second here, so hang on. This view holds that the Great Tribulation, the Rapture, the Resurrection, the Judgment, the Second Coming, they're all behind us. Now, according to the Preterists, the Great Tribulation was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman army in 70 A.D. And this has been the belief of Christians throughout the history of the church. It's been in the last 170 years or so that this has really been disputed. And we base our approach on the hermeneutical principle of audience relevance. Now, people, this is so important to understand. When you read your Bible, there are certain rules, all right, when you approach any written document. And hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. We're going to interpret the Bible. We have certain laws we have to go by. One of the rules that's fundamental to your understanding is called audience relevance. And what that means is when he wrote to a certain audience, that book has to make sense to them because he's written to them. So, you know, we have to read it in light of the original audience in order to understand it. If the book of Revelation was written to Berean Bible Church, which is in Hampton Roads, Virginia, we would read it differently than we do. For example, let's say verse 4 of Revelation 1. John, now what your Bible says is to the seven churches which are in Asia Minor. All right, but I took that out and put John to the Berean Bible Church, which is in Hampton Roads, Virginia. <coughs> if that's what verse 4 read, how would you interpret verse 1? The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated by an angel to his bondservant, John. Then we drop down to verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. Why? Because the time is near. Now, if this book was written to Berean Bible Church, that's what verse 4 said, and we read these first couple verses, when would you expect the things in this book to happen? Soon. That's what it says, right? Soon. They're near. Here's the problem. People have been reading this book of Revelation for 2,000 years, and they've been saying, oh, look, it's soon. Well, soon to who? It's soon to the seven churches that are in Asia Minor who lived in the first century. We have to keep in mind audience relevance. All right, this brings us to the third key in the theme of Revelation. That is, what is the theme here? What's the theme of this book? We began to touch on this last week. Almost every commentator agrees that Revelation 1-7 is the theme of the book. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be, amen. Now, I said last week, and I keep saying it over and over, if you understood the first three quarters of the Bible, which we call, mistakenly call the Old Testament, it's not old, the, co the covenant is old, the testament is not old, if you understood the first three quarters when you got to the last quarter, and you read, behold, he's coming with clouds, we're familiar with that. That is a picture of judgment. God came in the Old Covenant in judgment on different nations. So this is speaking of a judgment coming. We're from, we looked at that last week, all right? So let's move on. <clears throat> the coming in Revelation is spoken to be upon those who pierced him. Who is that? That's Israel, right? That is Israel. They are the one who pierced him. The New Testament continually points to the fact that the Jews... Israel were the ones who killed Christ. Now, we've seen that over and over in our study of the book of Acts. And he says also those who pierced him are the tribes of the earth. Now, a better rendering there would be the tribes of the land, and that refers to the promised land or Israel. So this book introduces its readers to the theology of judgment. And specifically, this book is talking about God's judgment sanctions against the nation Israel. Israel had crucified the Lord, 
they publicly called judgment down on themselves. Matthew 27, 25, and all the people said, this is Israel, his blood shall be on us and on our children. And it was. God's judgment on Israel in A.D. 70. Now, we know God judged Israel was destroyed in A.D. 70. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. That's historical. We know that happened. That was the judgment of God on Israel. And it matched the crime. The crime was the crucifixion of Christ. The crime was the worst in history, so their punishment was the worst in history. And to call anything else the Great Tribulation is to downplay the, the, the horror of this judgment and the horror of that generation's crime. Now, I think most of you are familiar with the Olivet Discourse. In the Olivet Discourse, it contains Christ's prophecy of destruction of the temple and of the tribulation. Now, a number of biblical scholars note that Revelation seems to be John's, and again, that's John Eleazar, or Lazarus, version of the Olivet Discourse. If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all have an Olivet Discourse. John doesn't. Why? Well, because John's Olivet Discourse is the book of Revelation. All right, and you'll see the similarity between those. We'll look at some comparisons here between the Olivet Discourse and Revelation. <clears throat> First of all, Revelation 1.1 says the events of this book are to take place soon. We already looked at that. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus Christ said, Truly I say to you, this generation. So it was to be in the generation that he lived, the generation in which he was speaking was going to see these things. So that fits with the soon of Revelation. All right. He's talking in Matthew 24, 21 about a great tribulation. In Revelation 7, 14, he says, these are the ones who came out of great tribulation. So they're both speaking of a time that's soon to come. They're both speaking of a great tribulation, not on the world, on the land, which is a designation for Israel. Finally, both mention the temple and its approaching destruction they even use the same terms. Revelation 11.2 says, Leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city 42 months. The word nations here is the Greek word ethnos. The word tread is pateo. <clears throat> Look at Luke 21.24. They will fall by the... Uh, Luke's all of a discourse. They will fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled. Trampled here is also the Greek word pateo, same word. The word Gentiles here, ethnos, same word. John and Luke are talking about the same subject. They use the same words. Now, the all of a discourse, which forms the foundation of Revelation, has a strong focus on Israel's fate. The fourth gospel is the only one of the gospels that doesn't talk about the Olivet Discourse. And as I said, that's because John dealt with that in Revelation. He didn't need to deal with it in the gospel. The theological content of the Olivet Discourse begins in Matthew 21, 19, where Christ curses the fig tree. Now, people, when you're going to the scripture, context is king. Always remember that. You can't take a Bible verse and just pull it out and say, look, at I got a good verse. What is the context? What is that talking about? What surrounds it? So before we get to the Olivet Discourse, we have to know the context. And Jesus curses the fig tree as he enters Jerusalem. And shortly thereafter, he gives a parable of the householder in Matthew 21, 33. In this parable, he prophesies that, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. Who's he talking to? The Jews. The kingdom's going to be taken from you Jews, and it's been given to a people producing the fruit of it. Now, they knew, his audience knew, they were speaking of Israel. Look at verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they understood he was speaking about them. In Matthew 23, if you're familiar with that, Jesus reproaches the scribes and the Pharisees. What's he call them? Over and over, he says in Matthew 23, what's he call the scribes and Pharisees? Hypocrites! Gentle Jesus, he blasts these scribes and Pharisees, over and over calling them hypocrites. In 23, 31 through 36, he notes that Israel historically killed the prophets, 
And now she is about to kill the Son of God. In Matthew 23, 36, he speaks of this generation. In verses 37 through 38, he focuses on Israel. The focus that he gives to Israel is indisputable. This is the context building up to the Olivet Discourse. The very question that opens the Olivet Discourse concerns the temple. All right, we come to Matthew 24. This is a passage that, you know, has great confusion today because people think it's talking about the end of the world. But just read it in its context. It's not talking about the world. Watch. Let's look at these first two verses. Jesus came out from the temple. They're all in the temple. They leave the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. In other words, saying, man, this is a marvelous place, isn't it, Lord? He said to them, you see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. That's a prophecy. He looks at this marvelous structure, this fortress. Not one stone will be left. Listen, even if, <clears throat> let's say this prophecy is true. Let's say an army does come in and destroy Jerusalem. Why would they not leave one stone on top of another? Why would they tear it all up? Because the fires in the temple melted the gold. The gold went down into the cracks of the stones, and the Roman army literally tore the place apart to get the gold out from the foundation. Amazing, huh? Just, just a coincidence, maybe. Not. The disciples responded to this, what Jesus had to say in verse 3, by as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? They connected the coming with the destruction of the temple with the end of the age. The disciples connected all those things together. And they were basically asking Jesus, you said this temple's going to be destroyed. When, Lord? When's it going to happen? See, the Jewish temple, here's what we have to understand, is at the heart of the Olivet Discourse. You miss that, you're going to go astray on the whole thing. Look at verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. The holy place, the Jewish temple. Now, notice what Jesus says in verse 6. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. That is not yet the end. How does that tell us anything? I mean, when have we not had wars and rumors of wars in the history of the world? Okay, very good. <laughs> All right, why is this a sign? If you lived in the era known as the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, this would have been a significant sign. See, Augustus inaugurated an age of peace in 17 B.C., in the Roman Empire proper, this period of peace remained comparatively undisturbed until the time of Nero. The Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was in effect. So we're not hearing of wars and rumors of war, because Rome squelched at everything. He, they had control. So the wars of rumors of wars in the Pax Romana, they're immediately to precede the tribulation, he says. Now, verse 14 he said, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. People today say, well, the gospel still hasn't been preached everywhere. So how could the end have already come? Has the gospel been preached to all the world? Well, Jesus said it was going to be. Now remember, Jesus is speaking to Jews, okay? Salvation is of the Jews. The early church was made up of Jews. It was approximately 10 years after Pentecost, remember in our study of Acts, before Gentiles even came into the church. Remember they founded the church in Antioch, that became the base of Gentile missions, and they began to go out into all the world from Antioch in Acts 11. And look at what Colossians says, Colossians 1, 5, and 6. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world. Now, Colossians is one of Paul's four prison epistles. <clears throat> the general consensus is that these epistles were written during Paul's imprisonment at Rome. If such is truly the case, then Paul wrote Colossians around 60 to 63 A.D. from Rome. So, by 63 A.D., the gospel had come to the Colossians, look, and all the world. 
That's what the scriptures say. You say, oh, the world? Well, it's talking about the known Roman world at that time. Not every single person, not every tribe that ever existed, but the gospel is covering the Roman world. It's going beyond Judaism. It's going to all nations. Look what Paul says in Romans 1.8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith, the faith of the Romans, is being proclaimed where? Throughout the whole world. What? The faith of the Romans, which was the gospel, is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. This is around 58 AD. And the whole world was hearing the gospel message. Back to verse 15 in Romans, Matthew 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation. So here Jesus speaks about this abomination of desolation. On this subject, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, wrote... When the temple was destroyed, Titus' army took the Roman emblem, an eagle, with SPQR. Now, the SPQR stands for the Senate and Population of Rome. On it, into the Holy of Holies, and set up and bowed down worship of Caesar. That's from Josephus' Jewish Wars, Book 6, Chapter 6, Paragraph 1. This was the final act of abomination that makes desolate. But it began with the encircling of Jerusalem by the Roman armies, according to Matthew or Luke 21, 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. He's writing, remember, he's writing to people in that day. He's saying, look, you people who live here, when you see Jerusalem getting surrounded by an army, you know they're in trouble. Now what are you going to do when you see an army circling Jerusalem? What's the inclination? To do what? The inclination is to get into the city. Why? It was a fortress. Jesus said, don't do that. Don't do that. He warns those in Judea to flee when they see the abomination of desolation. Look at Matthew 24, 16. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. People, if this book is, if this chapter is talking about a worldwide destruction, what good's it going to do you to run to the mountains? I mean, the mountains are getting destroyed too, so if it's the end of the world, going to the mountains isn't going to help. This is localized. It's talking about Jerusalem. Now listen, <clears throat> here's why Jesus told them to flee to the mountains. Nero died in the middle of the war against Jerusalem in June 68 AD. Suicide, he killed himself. Vespasian, who was leading the army at that time, went back to Rome to fight to become the new emperor. He's out there fighting Jerusalem. Nero dies. Whoop, I got to go back and try to take the spot over. So he left the battle and went back. During this time, the Christians who were in Jerusalem said, you know what Jesus said? If you're in Judea, flee the mountains. Let's get out of here. And the Christians took off. They heeded the warning of Matthew 24, 16. They took off. They saw it as a sign from God, and they left, and they fled to Pella. The Jews, though, they thought this was a sign from God as victory, and they gathered in Jerusalem in great numbers. And then the Romans came back and destroyed the city. That's just history. 21 says, For then there will be a great tribulation, which has not occurred since the beginning of the world, until now, nor ever will be. See, when the Romans resumed the Jewish war, they were furious, and they came in with a vengeance. The historians who wrote of this time, Josephus and Tacitus, and, and I've mentioned this before, but if you have not, Josephus has, someone has taken the works of Josephus and put them into a 20-hour audio format. They're one-hour things, 20 hours, all right? And they have background noise like you hear the horses and you hear it's dramatized like. I'll tell you what, you listen to those 20 hours, it'll set the hair on the back of your neck on edge. It's just history but you'll see how it correlates with what the scripture has to say. The historians say there was so much blood shed in Jerusalem that the blood was putting out fires in the buildings. The people were cutting each other open in Jerusalem to get the food out of each other. I mean, it was very, very bad inside the city. Mothers were roasting their own children and eating them. Now notice what is said. It says nothing will ever equal it. The destruction of Jerusalem was by f 
far more than the fall of a Jewish city. It was the destruction and conclusion of Old Covenant Israel. Verse 28 refers to the gathering of the eagles. The New American says vultures. Wherever the corpses, there will the vultures be gathered together. The eagle is a symbol of Rome. In other words, when Rome started gathering, Israel is going to be a corpse. Then verse 29 speaks of the stars falling from the sky. And we talk about that. The sun will, not, the sun will be darkened. So people read that and they say, well, that's clearly the end of the world. I mean, if the sun's going to be darkened, if the moon's not going to give us light, if the stars are going to fall, that's the end of the world. No, no, no. You're not familiar with the First Testament again. That language is used all through the First Testament of the destruction of a nation. Because if your nation is destroyed, guess what? The lights go out. In other words, if somebody came and destroyed America, what happens to our world? Our world ends. The stars fall. The light, it goes dark if, if America's destroyed because we're Americans. It's common apocalyptic terminology taken from the Hebrew Bible. Stars represent governments. Go all the way back to Genesis. Joseph's dream. Talks about the sun, moon, and stars bowing to him. What's his dad say? Our mother, your, uh, me, and your mom, and your brothers are going to bow down? Joseph didn't say, no, wait, wait, Dad, I didn't say anything about you and mom. I said the stars and the sun and the moon. See, they, they knew that star, sun, and moon thing was talking about leadership, government. Way back in Genesis, it starts in your understanding of apocalyptic language. Verse 30 tells us that the destruction of Jerusalem was a sign that Jesus had returned and was reigning with his saints in the kingdom. Verse 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in clouds. Again, you see this judgment. You know, Jesus is judging Israel. Verse 31 refers to what many would call the rapture. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. They'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one of the sky to the other. Now, if you compare this verse with 1 Thessalonians 4, you'll see they're the same event. This is a spiritual gathering into the kingdom of God. He's gathering the elect into the kingdom of God. Spiritually speaking, no one moved physically on the earth. In Matthew 24, 32 through 34, Jesus said that these things would all take place in that generation, the one he was speaking to. Now, some commentators have tried to make this generation here be race. In other words, that race, the race of the Jews will still be around. Shall not pass to all these things take place. Well, linguistically, that's impossible. They're different words. The temple was destroyed within 40 years. We know that, which was a generation. So 40 years from the time Jesus spoke this, it was destroyed. A biblical generation. And he says all these things will take place. That refers to the rapture. Heaven and earth passing away. The Lord's second coming. All that would happen within the generation to which Jesus was speaking. The focus of the Olivet Discourse is the destruction of Jerusalem at the second coming of Christ. Revelation simply expands on this Olivet Discourse. Not only is Israel's destruction the focus of the book of Revelation, but her destruction is set forth in an interesting fashion. She is punished for her adultery. Do you know in the First Testament, Israel was considered the wife of Yahweh, right? Look what Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 31, 31. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That's the old covenant. It's not going to be like the old covenant. My covenant which they broke, although... I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. See, often the prophets mention the marital relationship between God and Israel. But Israel chased after foreign gods and consequently was accused of spiritual adultery. And finally, Israel killed God's son while crying, we have no king but Caesar, his blood be on us and on our children. So Revelation, if you want to look at this book and understand what is the theme here, it's not talking about the end of the world. Revelation represents God's divorce decree against Israel. She is an unfaithful wife. She has committed spiritual adultery, and he is dealing with that unfaithful wife. In Revelation 4, we see God seated upon a judicial throne. It's interesting that God's throne is mentioned in 18 of Revelation's 22 chapters. The fact, in fact, throne occurs 62 times in the New Testament. 47 of them are in Revelation. 
This is a strong judicial undercurrent revelation. It's about judgment. God is judging me, not the world. He is judging Israel. In Revelation 5, God is, has in his hand a seven-sealed scroll, which represents his divorce decree against Israel. In Deuteronomy 24, God's law required that a writing of divorcement be presented in case of divorce. Well, here God presents the divorce papers to Israel. The scroll, which was written on the front and the back, reflects the imagery of Ezekiel chapter 2, where Ezekiel is handed a scroll that is written on the front and the back. Ezekiel 2, this scroll has to do with lamentations and mourning against Jerusalem. These two scrolls in Ezekiel and Revelation, they're the same. It's against Jerusalem. The seven seals of the scroll reflect the sevenfold judgment of God that he warned Israel about in Leviticus 26, 24. He says, then I will act with hostility against you, and I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sin. The sevenfold judgments in Leviticus have a strong influence in the judgment language of Revelation. Throughout this book, God's prescribed punishment for adultery, anybody know what the punishment for adultery is? Death by what? Stoning, Leviticus chapter 20. And look what we see in Revelation chapter 16, verse 21. And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, because its plague was extremely severe. Again, Josephus in his book, Jewish Wars, talks about the Romans catapulting these stones, huge 100-pound stones, over the wall in Jerusalem. Smashing the life out of people. Israel's being stoned. That's the imagery here. She's an adulterous wife. Well, you know, Israel was not only Yahweh's wife in the First Testament, but she was to serve him as a priest. Israel was to be the priest of God. Thus, in Revelation, Israel is represented as a harlot dressed in priestly garments. Since she is a priest, another First Testament law comes into effect. Leviticus 21.9 it says, also the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by harlotry, she profanes her father. She must be burned with fire. Here we see Israel being burned with fire in Revelation 17, 16. And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, and will make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh, and will burn her up with fire. So having legally disposed of Israel at the end of Revelation, God takes a new bride, the church of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 21, after Israel's death, we see the city coming down out of heaven adorned as a spotless virgin bride for her husband. And we read of the marriage supper of the Lamb. The new Jerusalem is the church. According to uh, Hebrews 12, 22, and 23, it says, But you have come to Mount Zion, that's God's dwelling place, Mount Zion. The city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem. To a myriad company of angels. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. See, that's the theme of Revelation is the execution of God's divorce decree against Israel for her harlotries. He's putting her away because she's been an adulterous wife. Put to death. He takes a new bride, which is the church, the spiritual Israel. Now... So we basically settled three keys in this book of Revelation. It was written before the destruction of Jerusalem. The prophecies refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. That's what it's talking about. The book centers around God's judgment of Israel by destroying it. Now, the identities of two main enemies in Revelation, the beast and the harlot, I think also provide clues to help us understand the interpretation of Revelation. I mean, you get, people get in this book and they get all kinds of fancy ideas about what this means and I remember one time I was going through a grocery store, and uh, when they first came out with the barcodes, the guy goes, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to that grocery store. What's a, what, why not? That's the mark of the beast. I'm like, on a box of cereal? You know? I mean, first of all, it's not on your hand or your forehead, so, you know, I don't know what that's going to hurt. But people have all kinds of strange ideas, which can be eliminated if you just understand Scripture correctly, all right? The beast is definitely one of the most dreaded images in Scripture. Everyone knows of his number. It's six. Six, six. Yeah, you know, I've seen people at the cash out, you know, register. Oh, yo, six dollars and sixty-six cents. Oh, wait a minute, let me get something else. You know, I'm like, come on, how superstitious are we? 
You know, I mean, that's just crazy. Everyone knows about this number. Any, you know, unsaved person know this. Most commentators agree that the beast imagery in Revelation, it shifts between generic and specific. The beast, in some contexts, is a kingdom, generically considered. Elsewhere, it's a political individual in that kingdom. In Revelation 13, 8, John says the beast is a man. But in 1711, the interpretive angel says that the beast is not only seven kings, but an eighth. So the generic identity of the beast is the Roman Empire of the first century. Jesus was crucified under the authority of the Roman Empire and the seven churches that Revelation is addressed to lived in that Roman Empire. Now what about the specific identity of the beast? I mean, who is Mr. 666 of Revelation 13, 18? It says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. Does this sound like he's trying to hide something here? This is wisdom. Calculate it. Figure it out, he's saying. Here's the, in other words, I want you to know this. The number is that of a man. His number is 666. You know who the beast is? The beast is none other than Lucius, Domitius, and Hinnabarbus. Y'all know who that is? He's better known by his adoptive name, which is what? Nero. Nero Claudius Caesar. Listen, people say, he's the beast? That's right, see, the beast is gone. He's already dead, he's, he's out of the picture now. But he was writing to people in the first century. That had to be relative to them. He, Nero is really the only man that fits the bill as a specific and personal expression of the beast. Let's look at some of Nero's qualifications to be this beast. The beast is identified by the number 666. Now, in the ancient days, alphabets served a twofold purpose. All right? The first and foremost purpose was, of course, to serve as letters, but the letters were also assigned numerical values and thus served as numerals. I think we're familiar with this because of Roman numerals. You know, we use them as numbers. So we understand that. Well, the Greek and Hebrew languages operated similarly. Nero Caesar, if spelled according to a Hebrew spelling, and John, and of course the most of his first century Christians were Hebrews, all right? It gives us the precise value of 666. That's the numerical value of Nero Claudius Caesar. <clears throat> now, is it a coincidence that the most relevant emperor who lived while the seven churches lived and who lived while John wrote, has a name that fits precisely with what John said the name would be? Is that a coincidence? I don't think it is. But that's the first century audience. It, it's, a, it's relevant to them. Is this a sheer coincidence? Is this a historical accident? Oh, God said, oh, I didn't know Nero was going to be emperor at that time. I shouldn't have put that in there. That confused him. No. God knows exactly what's going on. What would have been the purpose of frustrating readers for 2,000 years trying to figure out who this beast is, and we're still in the 21st century, we just we keep looking. Every new president we don't like, it's him. Now it's Obama. You know, everyone we don't like, that's who the beast is, you know. It's been everybody under the sun. It's far more reasonable to assume that John's original readers in the first century understood very well the identification of the beast. It's wisdom. Calculated. He wanted him to understand. The character of the beast qualifies Nero for this role. Nero was called by his contemporaries a beast. He possessed a bestial nature, many writers said. Nero often acted in horrible viciousness. According to Suetonius, Nero was a sodomite who is said to have castrated a boy named Spurius and married him. He enjoyed homosexual rape and torture. He killed his parents, he killed his brother, he killed his wife, he killed his aunt, he killed his tutor. He so prostrated his own chastity that after defiling almost every part of his body, he at last devised this kind of game. He would cover himself with the skin of a wild animal and get in a cage, and then he would be let loose from this cage, and he would attack the private parts of men and women who were bound to the stakes. He was sick. He was a very sick man. He was a beast. This is history. Revelation 13, 7 speaks of the power given to the beast to make war with the saints. 
Now, remember, we're been, we've been in the book of Acts. So hopefully this is clear in your mind. Remember what happened with Paul in the last story in the book of Acts when they brought him before the emperor and the emperor says, that, that's, that's fine. Paul literally was protected. The Christians from that point on were protected by the Roman Empire because they were seen as a sect of Judaism. Well, that changed with Nero. He was the first empirical authority to begin to persecute Christianity again. And Tacitus records the scene in Rome when the persecution of the Christians broke out. Tacitus was a, a Roman historian. He said, And their death was aggravated with mockeries, insomuch that wrapped in the hides of wild beasts, they were torn to pieces by dogs or fastened to crosses to be set on fire, that when the darkness fell, they might be burned to illuminate the night. Basically, Nero used Christians to light his garden. He would put them on stakes, cover them with pitch, and then light them on fire to light his garden. Revelation 13.5, now catch this please, another coincidence here. 13.5 says the beast would continue for 42 months. Here's what's interesting. The Neuronic Persecution was instituted in 64 A.D., and it lasted until Nero's death in 68 A.D., which is three and a half years, 42 months. Just another coincidence in the Bible. How about that? Nero fits the bill of the beast. The Bible says the beast is to die by a sword, according to Revelation 13, 10, and 14. You know how Nero died? Take a wild guess. According to Suetonius, he drove a dagger into his throat aided by Epaphroditus, his private secretary. So Nero was killed with the sword, he lived by the sword, he died by the sword. And by the way, the, the Roman sword, the Machaira, was a very short, more dagger-type thing that the Romans used in battle. Revelation 13, 7 tells us that the beast is red. Now that's interesting, how does Nero fit that? The red color may be indicative of the bloodshed caused by the beast. That could be possible, but listen. Suetonius writes of the legend associated with Nero's ancestral parentage, which explained why Nero had a red beard. Now, that's really strange in that day, you know, for a Roman to have a red beard. The beast number is 666. In Hebrew, in Hebrew Nero's name adds up to 666. The beast is an awful character. Nero had a bestial character. The beast made war with the saints for 42 months. Nero's persecuted Christians for three and a half years. The beast dies by a sword. Nero killed himself with a dagger. The beast is red. Nero had a red beard, which I said was very unusual in those times. Evidently, the beast in Revelation is Nero. And those first century saints, the seven churches in Asia Minor, when they read that, they understood he's talking about the emperor Nero. And he said these things are soon to take place. Guess what? They saw them soon take place very soon after the writing of this book. We, you and I, 21st century Christians, are not to be looking for the beast. We're not to be looking for the tribulation. It's over. It already happened. I hate to disappoint you. You know, you're going to miss the tribulation. You already missed it. All right? And I know that's sad. You know, Christians, and you see, preterism is a very positive eschatology. We're not looking for doom and gloom. It's over. We live in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's a second enemy in Revelation, and it's the harlot. Let's look at the harlot quickly, and we'll, we'll close with the harlot here. Uh, and it says, And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names. You got a woman, she's sitting on a scarlet beast, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. What is that? That's priestly garments, people. All right, the God, this whore, this whore, this harlot has the garments of a priest on. And she's adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead is a name written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Okay, this woman... This drunk woman has been killing saints. Again, you go back to Acts. 
Israel, Jerusalem, is persecuting, killing the saints. And with the blood of the witness of Jesus, when I saw her, I wondered greatly. Now, since the woman is seated upon a seven-headed beast and is called Babylon, some have thought she represents the city of Rome. But since the beast is Rome, this would be redundant. Babylon is used to refer to an enemy of God. That's Babylon, which in this case is Israel. There are several reasons, I think, to identify the harlot as Jerusalem. The harlot's called Babylon. Babylon is called the, the great city in Revelation 14.8. In Revelation 11.8, it says, which, where the Lord was crucified. So Babylon is called, Jerusalem is called Babylon. We know that. We know where the Lord was crucified. She is great because of her covenantal status of the First Testament. She was a great whore. Jerusalem had previously been called by pagan names comparable to Babylon. Uh, Revelation 11.8 says spiritually she's called Sodom and Egypt. This is because she acts like God's enemy. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, God calls Jerusalem Sodom and Gomorrah because of her sinfulness. And it says this harlot is filled with blood of the saints according to Revelation 17, 6, 16, 6, 18, 21, and 24. And throughout the book of Acts, Jerusalem is portrayed as the persecutor of Christianity. We see this in Acts 7, for example, just to refresh your memory. He says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears... You always resist, this is Stephen speaking to the Jewish leadership. Always resist the Holy Spirit. You are doing just what your fathers did, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute. They killed those who previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. In the Olivet Discourse context, Jesus said of Israel, in Matthew 23, 34, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogue and persecute from city to city. This harlot was a persecutor of Jerusalem, of, of Christians, I mean. She was Jerusalem. The harlot is arrayed in Jewish priestly colors, according to Revelation 17.4. Exodus 28 prescribes these colors for the high priest. The high priest also wore a tiara on his forehead that said, Holiness to the Lord. Exodus 28.36-38. The harlot has a blasphemous tear on her forehead, according to Revelation 17, 5. She was supposed to be holy to the Lord, but she has become the mother of harlots. There is an obvious literary contrast between the harlot and the bride that comes down out of heaven. And if you compare Revelation 17 and Revelation 21, we see two women. One's a harlot, the other's a bride. One is Jerusalem that is above, the other is Jerusalem from below. Paul talked about these two Jerusalems in Galatians 4, 25 through 26. Notice how John introduces the harlot, Revelation 17, 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come up here. I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And now notice how he introduces the bride. The one, then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. You see, they are negative mirror images. They both talk about the seven angels with seven bowls. They both say, come here, I will show you. One says the great harlot, one says the bride. The harlot is seated on, on a seven-headed beast, which obviously represents Rome. This indicates not identity with Rome, but some form of alliance with Rome. The Jews were the ones that demanded Christ's crucifixion. They got Rome to do it. And when Pilate wanted to turn Jesus loose because he found no guilt in him, what did the Jews say? They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, now watch this. This is a Jew saying this. We have no king but Caesar. A Jew? A Jewish leader saying we have no king but Caesar? The Jews are siding with Caesar against Jesus. They constantly agitated against the Christians to get the Romans involved in their persecution. In Acts 17, 7, the Christians were accused by the Jews as those who preached another king contrary to the decrees of Caesar. So the harlot is seated on the beast because Jerusalem depended on Rome to persecute the Christians. Revelation was obviously written before Nero's death in AD 68. Had to be. Talks about Nero. 
The prophecies of this book have been fulfilled. It was written about things which would soon take place after its writing. The book begins and opens with time statements. It deals with the persecution of believers under Judaism and Rome, and it predicts God's judgment upon these enemies of the church. Its purpose, therefore, is to strengthen and encourage believers in time of trial. This book is to be understood preteristically rather than futuristically. And in doing so, you avoid all the wild speculation of interpreting everything in the daily news as a sign of the times. This first century, Christians who got this letter knew what it was spoken of. It was to them. It was to the seven churches. It was to happen soon, shortly, quickly. They understood it. It deals with Nero. It deals with Jerusalem. Listen, people, our country is not getting worse and worse because it, we're in the end times. All right? It's all, everything that happens in the world. You know, guy last week flies his plane into the building. Oh, sign of the times. Sign of what times? People have always been evil. They always will be evil. It's not getting worse and worse because we're in the end times. It's getting worse and worse because we as Christians have neglected our calling. We're no longer preaching righteousness. We're preaching health wealth. And we wonder why, you know, America is such a mess spiritually. Listen, believers, you and I, we are to be salt and light. We are to call the world in which we live to faith in Jesus Christ. We are, we are to hold up the standard. And when our government says you've got to start killing babies, we have to hold up the standard and say, no, we're Christians. And we have to be willing to pay the price for it. Just like the early Christians did. They stood for what was right. It cost them. Now, we're not used to that today. Again, we're used to this health, wealth, everything. You know, hey, if you're a Christian, guess what? You get a, you get a brand new Lincoln Continental, and you know, and you got a mansion, and everything's wonderful. Man, those first Christians, they were like, hmm, we missed out the boat here. We got beat, we got tortured, we got killed. Because they stood up for what the truth was. People, if our country keeps on the way it's going, it's going to start costing us to believe. It's going to start costing us to, to speak out for Christianity. I think that futurism causes a pessimistic attitude towards the future because, you know, we're looking for gloom and doom. We're looking for, you know, the world to come to an end. We're looking for the great tribulation. No, we're not. It's all past. Those believers who continue to look for a second coming that will be soon, they set them up for themselves up for disappointment. They're looking for something they already have. How sad is that? How sad to be looking and longing, I can't wait for Jesus to come. And Jesus is saying, I'm here. <laughs> you're missing out on fellowship with me because you're waiting for me to get here when I'm already here. I've kept my word. I said soon, quickly, shortly, this generation, some of you standing here, and I kept my word. That gives me great comfort, people, to know our God keeps his word. Look at Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. You know that, to be true in your own life? That's a... That's a given, isn't it? Well, look it. But desire fulfilled is a tree of life. See, our hope, our desire has been realized in the second coming of Christ. The tabernacle of God is with men. He dwells with us now, and we live in the glories of the new covenant age. All the promises of God are yea and amen in him. We're complete. We're not looking for anything. We're not waiting for anything. We're not hoping for anything. We have it all in Jesus Christ. We just need to learn to live in it. To enjoy the blessings that are ours right now. Listen, we have fellowship with the living God. Go to him anytime we want to in prayer. 24-7, never sleep. <laughs> Always there listening and desires us to come before him. It's incredible. That's where we live. So Revelation is not about the future. To us, it's about the past. It was about the future to the first century saints, and it was given to bring encouragement to them, to let them know, hey, I'm coming, I'm going to deal with this situation. I'm going to stop the persecution. And he did. Let's pray.